Hello. 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 Can you all hear me? Hands up if you can't hear me. Ah, there's always a couple, isn't there? Actually, he's usually only one, but you know, two's good. Uh, well, hello then. Uh, welcome to the final talk. I'll be introducing the next speaker. That's me. Uh, Dr. David Luke, I think. Uh, just uh, out of interest, anybody been to one of my lectures before? I'm oh, very sorry for you guys, so you might have heard some of this before. Uh, for the rest of you, great, just strap your boots on. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, psychedelics, mental health, and mystical experience. Look at that check. And uh, so I'm David Luke, I'm a psychologist. I wasn't always a psychologist. Um, I was a screwed up teenager, like every other psychologist, and wanted to know why, so I went away and studied psychology, and of course here I am, many, many years later, and I'm still screwed up, but at least I know why, so that's why this one. Um, it comes in handy for something. Uh, so that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Uh, I'm based at the University of Greenwich, not far from here, just over the water. It's actually one of our rivals, Birkbeck, but you know, that's okay. Um, and uh, based on the psychology department, I do a lot of research on psychedelics. I sometimes do research when I'm not on psychedelics as well, but that isn't <laughs> anywhere near as much fun. Um, and I do a lot of research on what I call exceptional human experience, so all the kind of the weird end of the spectrum of uh, psychology. I teach on the mainstream psychology course what we call abnormal psychology, which is a, a, an awful phrase actually. But that's what you get on an average psychology degree. You get, you know, the stuff, the, the normal, so-called normal psychology, you know, all the stuff in the middle, like social psychology, individual differences, personality, and all of that, neuroscience, and then you get abnormal psychology, so-called, all the all the stuff that happens when things go wrong. Um, but what I teach is, is the other end of the spectrum, and those are unusual experiences which are not necessarily pathological, which are called exceptional psychology. Uh, you don't get a lot of that on a, on a neuro psychology degree. It's all about the normal stuff or what happens when it goes wrong. I'm talking about the, the really interesting, kind of weird end of the spectrum. Uh, so one of the things we do at Greenwich is uh, we organise a conference there. Some of you may have heard of it, called Breaking Convention. Have you heard of it? That's one of our directors down there. I don't know what she's doing. What are you doing here? Um, and we started out actually at the University of Canterbury in Kent in 2011. And we thought, you know, hadn't had a uh, psychedelic conference in the UK, we put one on, and we were enormously surprised, there was about 500 people turned up, and it was a great success, and they weren't all hippies either, which was another surprise, um, mostly academics, mostly hippie academics actually, but there you go, and so we thought we'd do that again, uh, a couple of years later we did the University of Greenwich this time, in 2013, we had something like 700 people come, and we were kind of enormously uh, rewarded by that experience. So we kept doing it every two years at Greenwich, 2015. We had something like 800 people come. There's Amy at the front, look. You, look, you, you can see one of them just down there. That's you, isn't it? Sorry, Amy. Um, and you know, the whole conference itself, just coming, was kind of quite a transformative experience. We had over 150 speakers, workshops. We weren't giving out any psychedelics, I hasten to add. And kind of music and art and after parties. And just being there, people felt refreshed and changed. Um, and so we thought we'd put it on again uh, this year, and uh, we thought we might look something like that. Uh, it wasn't far off, actually. I haven't actually got the photo this time, but um, there was about a thousand people coming. And just telling you all that, not just to plug our brilliant convention, but also to say that this is a really expanding field of interest within the academy. It's kind of literally a mushrooming field of research and scholars from every department come to our conference and they're growing year on year. Uh, it's a hot button topic, you might say, uh, if you're prone to saying things like that. Now, the thing about psychedelics is, not only are they, they're becoming more prevalent in their research within the academy, the number of psychedelics we know about has been steadily increasing. Um, in fact, not just steadily increasing, but exponentially increasing. So, being a good scientist, I tried to plot a graph on this. And it was said, you know, in 1900, we knew of about two psychedelic substances at that time. And uh, Alexander Shulgin, the godfather of MDMA, said that, you know, the number of psychedelics that we know about has increased by a factor of 10 every 50 years. 
So sure enough, by 1950, there were something like 20 psychedelics. By the year 2000, there were 200 different psychedelic substances that we knew of. Uh, so sure enough, <laughs> this is one of my test subjects. Already. Yeah, yeah, it's started. <laughs> What they put in your coffee. Um, and so I, I wanted to check this. So in 2012, I did a kind of quick survey, and we reckon there's about 350 different psychedelic substances we know of, which means that we're on course for this exponential increase. By 2050, there'll be 2,000. By 2100, there'll be 20,000 different psychedelic substances, all of which put you in kind of somewhat of a slightly different altered state of consciousness. So there's a lot to, to discover and explore what I can tell us about neuroscience, about human psychology and you know the weird ways in which you can experience reality whatever that is so for those of you who don't know and are able to blot out the weird noise coming out out of the wall behind me i'll give you a really chewy definition of what psychedelics are and that is they are substances which without causing physical addiction actually some of them do <laughs> cause physical addiction but we won't talk about those uh, craving major physiological disturbances delirium Actually, some of them are called deliriants, so we'll ignore those as well. Disorientation or amnesia, and yes, some of them do cause amnesia. Um, they more or less reliably produce thought, mood, and perceptual changes, otherwise rarely experienced except in dreams, contemplative and religious exaltation, which we'll be looking at in more detail, and flashes of vivid involuntary memory and acute psychosis. So that's a kind of somewhat useful definition, uh, but we'll move on from that. Essentially, psychedelics make uh, changes, qualitative changes to your state of consciousness. Most other psychoactive drugs will just, you know, stimulate you or kind of reduce your levels of stimulation They'll relax you, you know, like uh, stimulants, for instance, or, you know, benzodiazepines. But psychedelics change everything about your experience of consciousness, from your sense of self, uh, your sense of time, uh, your kind of moods, your perceptions of the outside world, everything can change in a psychedelic experience. So I'm going to give you a little bit of the science behind that. It's going to be very small. Here's a chemistry lesson. Um, there you go. That's the chemistry lesson over. No, I'll, I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit for you. So there's two major classes of psychedelics that we know of. Uh, the first type are called tryptamines, uh, and they are structurally similar to tryptamine, which is also the, the base compound of, of uh, serotonin. Uh, serotonin, as you probably know, is a very um, important neurochemical in the brain. It's a, a responsible for our kind of mood and our kind of keeping us kind of happy and alert, and also for higher cognitive functions like you know everyday good stuff like thinking and problem solving and decision making. So it's a very important chemical in our brain. And these psychedelics, tryptamines, uh, are somewhat structurally similar to serotonin, and they also work in a large part on the serotonergic system in the brain. And they include things like LSD, psilocybin, which is the active principle in magic mushrooms, and DMT, which is naturally occurring psychedelic um, in the human body, even. Uh, then there's another class of uh, psychedelics which are called phenethylamines. They're more structurally similar to dopamine. Uh, they also work on the dopaminergic system, but also affect the serotonin system as well. Uh, so you can think of these as being like psychedelic amphetamines, because they belong to the amphetamine family, and they include things like mescaline, MDMA, it was known as ecstasy, and all these kind of new designer drugs like 2CB, 2CI, 2C, whatever you want, really. Um, all the alphabetamines, if you want to call them that. <laughs> Many of them, anyway. Uh, and so, you know, it'd be kind of quite nice for our understanding of neurochemistry and uh, neurobiology if there was just these two categories, but there's not. There's a whole bunch of other psychedelics which don't fit easily into those categories, things like uh, diterpenoids. Uh, mu opioid, receptor agonists, anticholinergics, cholinergics, NMDA antagonists, cannabinoids, etc., etc., etc. So it makes it all the more complicated and the more interesting as well. Um, that's the chemistry lesson over. Uh, I think. Oh no, I lied. Just to just to kind of demonstrate that to you in a bit more of a kind of graphical way, you'll notice that uh, most of these all kind of have a very similar structure. And all structurally similar to serotonin, LSD, DMT, psilocin and psilocybin and 5 toxic DMT. They all have this basic tryptamine structure. And then the one, the other one out on the right at the bottom there is mescaline, which has this kind of more dopamine-like structure. There you go. That's tryptamine and there's dopamine. There you go. That's the chemistry lesson definitely over with. 
Um, moving on to the neuroscience. Um, now, we didn't know much about the neuroscience of, of psychedelics. I mean, some amount, but we'd never done any brain imaging with psychedelics until very recently. Uh, and that would seem quite strange because, you know, high-tech brain imaging has been around for, for quite a while. Uh, but there's one kind of small component to doing research, and that is, you know, availability and, and legality and all those kind of things. And something happened in the 1960s called Prohibition, which made uh, psychedelics illegal. Um, now, that was aimed, supposedly, to stop people taking them recreationally. It didn't do that, because the number of people taking all recreational drugs, so-called, has steadily increased year on year since the late 1960s when Prohibition came in, uh, including psychedelics. And they've got cheaper, more available, uh, they're purer, there's more people taking them, and they're taking more of them than they ever were. Uh, so Prohibition didn't really stop people taking drugs. What it did do is it stopped uh, researchers doing research with them scientifically in humans. So there wasn't really any human studies with psychedelics until very recently. Uh, that research began very quietly in the 90s, became a bit of a renaissance by the noughties, and by 2012, you know, we were doing brain imaging research finally with these substances. Uh, and that began a lot of it in London. Actually, it began in Zurich before that, but they've been pioneering it here at Imperial, not far from there in London, and so they did the first, uh, well they didn't do the first, they did the most major fMRI study of psilocybin, and um, they wanted to know what happens in the human brain when you give somebody psychedelics, and if you'd asked any neuroscientist worth their fantastic brain imaging grants, you know, what happens in the human brain, you give someone a psychedelic, you have you know, this intense, overwhelming experience, pretty much all of them would say, well, you know, there's a part of your brain which will increase in activity. And they'd all have their pet theory about their favourite bit of the brain, you know, the neuroscientists like. Uh, but they were all wrong, because there wasn't any increase in activity in the brain. And I'm going to show you that. Uh, there was lots of great media reports, though, um, about the possible implications of this. And uh, I, I even took part as a subject in this, so I have kind of first-hand information of this. I was kind of put in a MEG scanner, um, which, if you don't know, is... Uh, a kind of huge kind of cylinder full of liquid nitrogen above your head, uh, which is almost like a semiconductor, and picks up very, very small uh, amounts of activity, of electrical activity in the brain, and you get this kind of uh, readout of, like a really super refined EEG, if you know what an EEG is, and it's called MEG, however, it's called magnetoencephalography, uh, for those of you who don't know, I don't know what's going on with my, maybe you can just see that there. Nothing to do, however, with uh, Magneto from the X-Men. He's obviously a bit averse to uh, doing this kind of research, hence the metal helmet. Um, anyway, so I was injected with psilocybin and put in what looks like a perming device. Uh, but it gives you a bit of a cosmic perm, I can uh, point that out. Uh, but I did live to tell the tale. There's me again. I don't know, this is what I did on my holidays kind of thing. Sorry about that. Okay, so, so the interesting thing was they didn't find an increase in activity anywhere in the brain, and the lead researcher, Robin, said, well, you know, seeing a decrease was surprising. What they actually found was a decrease in this key region. He said, we thought profound experience equaled more activity, but not necessarily. And what they found was this kind of brain image here kind of indicates quite clearly all the increases in brain activity are in red. Well, there aren't any, unless you're colorblind. Uh, they're, they're only blue, which means that those regions are decreased in activity. And what we find is the, most of the decrease is in a region called the default mode network, which is uh, to do with your kind of sense of self and your kind of external awareness and your kind of sense of attention and awareness to the outside world. And what they found that the de decreases in activity in that region were actually related to the intensity of the experience. So you get these nice kind of correlational graphs like that, that those people who have more intense subjective experiences have more decrease in activity in this key hub region in the brain. Uh, as I said, uh, reduction of activity in default mode network enabled a state of unconstrained cognition. Now that's not the whole picture, however, but it was a massive surprise. They then reanalyzed their data and uh, in a slightly different way, they looked at interconnectivity between different brain regions. So, this, uh, this kind of schematic here is kind of your brain, if you like, or well, my brain, actually, uh, and a few other people's. 
and the, the, the circles around the edge represent the different regions of the brain. And the lines in between represent the amount of communication between those different regions. So the one on the left is your brain not on drugs, it's your brain on a placebo, and you'll see there's a small amount of interconnectivity between different regions of the brain. And then the one on the right, you'll notice, is a little bit different. Uh, that's under the influence of psilocybin. And the first thing you notice is it doesn't look like a scrambled egg, which was a massive surprise as well, because that's what we were told to believe for many years. You know, this is your brain on drugs. <laughs> Crack an egg into a frying pan. Um, what actually happens is there's a lot more interconnectivity between different regions of the brain. So hyperconnectivity. So, you know, suddenly your occipital lobe starts up a conversation with your temporal lobe. Oh, hi. We haven't chatted in a while. We were strangers, but now we're good friends suddenly. And interesting things occur. So, now, how do you kind of rationalise that with the idea that, okay, you've got this hyperconnectivity, but there's also no increase in activity anywhere in the brain, in fact a decrease in this key region. They seem somewhat incongruous initially, but then think of it like this. Monday morning, so tomorrow morning, uh, think of all the people who are going to drive to work in London. It's kind of going to be quite hectic on the road, especially with all the snow. I mean, we didn't make it here. Uh, and you just say, okay, I'm going to say half of the people who have to drive to work, just stay at home and watch Rick and Morty. It's probably better educational value anyway. And... The other half of you go off to interesting places like Bognor Regis and Birmingham and other places that begin with B. And that's kind of what's happening in the brain, your, your, your brain being the country, and that there's more <laughs> communication between different regions, but there's less activity going on overall. With that awful analogy, you'll be delighted to know that's the end of the neuroscience lecture. Uh, it's not rocket science, is it? But then rocket science is quite simple anyway, so don't worry about the neuroscience. Uh, we'll move on to the psychology, because that's the important thing, I think. Um, and so what are the basic psychological effects? Um, now, I'm going to give you a really chewy definition. You could probably skip all of that. They affect all of our mental functions, perception, emotion, thinking, body awareness, our sense of self. Our perceptual sensory effects often but not always are primary. Objects in our field of vision appear brighter or duller, larger or smaller, seem to be shifting shape and melting. Sounds are softer, or louder, or harsher, or gentler. We hear new rhythms in the wind. Our emotions overflow or dry up. Anxiety or fear of pleasure or relaxation, all feelings wax and wane. Our thinking processes speed up or slow down. <laughs> if you're feeling any kind of strange sensations, that's just me talking, don't worry. <laughs> Thoughts themselves become fused, confused or clearer. The significance of things take on more importance than the things themselves, i.e. meaning becomes amplified. Time collapses. In the blink of an eye, two hours pass, or time expands. A minute contains a never-ending march of sensations and ideas. We feel the body no longer exists, or that the mind and the body have separated. So there's many, many, many things that can occur. In short, psychedelics affect every aspect of our consciousness. So that's a quote from uh, Rich Strassman. I mean, the, the bottom line is the take-home message, essentially. Um, but it's important to remember that the substances themselves are not the whole story. Uh, and this kind of mistake was made earlier on when they were looking at these substances back in the 1950s. They thought, you know, that these things are psychotomimetic. Now, they just discovered the first neurotransmitter at the time, serotonin. They realised that LSD, which they recently just discovered, also had a structural structure similar to serotonin, they figured, you know, psychosis could then therefore be a kind of imbalance of chemicals in the brain. And things like LSD could mimic psychosis. And so these things were researched for their properties as psychotomimetics, things that mimic psychosis. And they did things like put people in a room, handcuff them to a bed, unlock the door on their first ever acid trip without any preparation. And guess what? You know, people had bad experiences. <laughs> See? It's a psychotomimetic, they had a psychotic reaction. There you go, proves our theory. Um, what they then shortly after discovered was if you put somebody in a, in a room with nice lighting and you don't handcuff them and you, know, you play the nice music and you have a nice therapist there to help them through the experience, they tend to have nice experiences, go figure. So uh, the, the context in which people take these substances are extremely important. And so it's not just the substance, i.e. the dosage and what the, what the drug is, uh, set, i.e. your psychological framework and the setting where you take the drug are as equally important. So those three things together 
substance set and setting are what the, the factors that predict the kind of experience you'll have. Um, and that was one of the kind of most important things that Timothy Leary did before he left Harvard and became the high priest of psychedelia under a bit of a kind of media storm. Because um, he came up with the phrase. There he is. There he is as high priest of psychedelia shortly after leaving Harvard. Um, he wasn't always blue. Uh, so <laughs> well, what next? Okay, so how do we uh, ameliorate then the, the, the possibility for psychological, difficult psychological experiences, i.e. bad trips? I mean, we don't no longer call them bad trips. We call them difficult psychological experiences. And set and setting are quite important. But you're all asking, well, you know, how often do these bad experiences occur? And we can't say with any certainty. There's a little bit of data now coming through, uh, mostly based on survey reports. Um, in the clinical context, uh, for instance, at John Hopkins University, uh, it's a leading medical university in the States. They've been giving people psilocybin for experiments. And they said out of several hundred participants they've had first, so far, they've given them psilocybin in a, in a well-prepared and contained context, only one person has had a, a lasting negative experience. So in, in the right set and setting, you can reduce the prevalence of, of a difficult or bad trips quite significantly. If you look at recreational users, there are some online surveys that have been conducted, a couple of thousand uh, respondents. Um, those in the blue, you can't read the key probably, so I can make up anything. But um, I'm gonna tell you with honesty that the, the people in the blue region, over 50% are those who never had a bad experience on psychedelics. These are recreational users. Uh, those in the green are those people who had a bad experience, uh, maybe one, about 10% of the time. Uh, those, the little sliver of the red, are those people who always had bad experiences. Uh, those are the ones who probably shouldn't be taking psychedelics. Uh, so the prevalence of, of difficult psychological experiences is you know, relatively positive, um, but you know, they do happen, of course. <laughs> Um, and I can, you know, can break down that data for different drugs. Different drugs seem to have different prevalence rates for difficult experiences. But the way people are, are looking at it now, researchers are saying, well, even the difficult parts of a trip, now not, it might not be that the whole trip is difficult or challenging, uh, just sections of it. And usually people report that they get their best insights from those challenging experiences. So it may be kind of the long, dark tea time of the soul, uh, but that they have kind of positive rewards <coughs> from going through that troublesome period. And certainly within the clinical context, in the therapeutic context, those difficult experiences are, are kind of somewhat expected and also quite useful because it allows you know, the, the, the person to work through difficult experiences or psychological um, sticking points or traumas or whatever it may be. So they're kind of gold dust for the therapist really. Uh, so long as the person ultimately comes out of it feeling like they've resolved the issues or that they're not traumatised or re-traumatised by the actual experience, we're making progress. Uh, okay, so I'll leave that there for now. But what about um, the onset of psychosis then? I mean, not all difficult experiences lead to, to psychotic reactions. Uh, and so what is the prevalence of, of psychosis? This is an interesting question. It wasn't really answered until recently. Um, but it used to be said in the 60s, you know, if you've taken LSD three times, by definition, you're clinically insane. Uh, now, I don't know who said that, but it was kind of one of those things that was banded around, you know, with these urban myths. You don't know, I think that's true either. Um, it wasn't until recently there was a couple of large-scale epidemiological surveys were conducted across large kind of cross-sections of, of, of people in the United States, 130,000 people in two different surveys each, and uh, they looked at people's previous use of, of or life use of, of drugs and their incidence of psychiatric treatment and mental health problems. And they found that all, well, virtually all drugs were related to worse mental health conditions. So that, you know, if you have a history of taking drugs, you typically had a history of mental health conditions. You were more likely to, that was the trend. Except for psychedelics. Uh, and they found that, actually, in, if you drill it down to certain substances, people who had taken LSD and psilocybin had lower incidences of psychological distress than the, than the, the national population, than the national average. Um, one year, uh, psychiatric medication inpatient treatment was redu reduced with those people who used psilocybin. 
for instance. And just to put that graphically, uh, you would expect these bars to be on the right hand side of the dotted line because that would indicate a, a kind of uh, an increased tendency to have these kind of psychiatric uh, indicators if you're taking these drugs. And what we find is most of these are actually below the dotted line. So that the general use of psychedelics is associated with better mental health across the large population uh, surveys. Now that doesn't mean that individuals won't have a psychotic reaction if they take a psychedelic, um, because we know that does happen. Everyone's got a story of a friend of a friend who took LSD and went mad and never came back. Uh, so how is it we see it across large populations? We don't find any trends, but we have individual cases. So uh, now you can't extrapolate from individual cases, of course, but what you can say is that possibly there are people in society who have a propensity or underlying predisposition to develop psychosis, and taking a psychedelic may be a trigger for that, particularly if it's not taken in the right context, the right set and setting, i.e. in a held and trusted environment. But on the whole, we don't see a large-scale epidemic of psychosis. Uh, if you're looking at the clinical data, I mean, in the 1950s and 60s, these substances were used uh, on a kind of fairly large scale for treating psychiatric conditions uh, within psychiatric institutions. And I'm not going to kind of quench through all of that, but basically the incidence of, of suicide was no greater than in the rest of the psychiatric population, and in some cases much lower as well. So, so just to sum that up, within the clinical context, we don't find a, an elevated risk of psychosis and suicide through the use of psychedelics within a clinical context, and we don't find an epidemiological relationship between psychosis and the use of psychedelics in the general population either. Uh, what we also know about these substances is, from a clinical perspective, well, not recreationally, is that the physiological risk of these substances, at least the, the known classic psychedelics, uh, are very, relatively low. So, for instance, there's no known overdose value for psilocybin or LSD. I just said that again. There's no known overdose value for psilocybin or LSD. And we know that because they've tried to test it and haven't found it. We have stories of drug smugglers, you know, who, you know, the classic way of smuggling drugs across borders. If you've got relatively small quantities, you can wrap it up in something and swallow it. Uh, the thing is with LSD, Pure LSD, uh, a gram of pure LSD is 10,000 doses. So if you wrap up a few grams of LSD and swallow it, and then it happens to open up inside you on the plane, uh, I mean, that's a very, very serious trip. I mean, the plane lands, you're still flying. Uh, that has happened, and the person involved lived to tell the tale. So people have, have been known to accidentally ingest tens of thousands of doses and survive. Uh, psilocybin also has no known overdose value. Now, that's a curious statement really because psilocybin kills approximately zero people every year from overdose, uh, so it's very physiologically safe, but however, it's a class A drug, okay? You can get a maximum of seven years in prison for possession and up to a lifetime in prison for supply. Um, now, what they found in recent clinical drug trials is, well, a, a preliminary uh, research, I'd say, it's not a full drug, drug trial, but psilocybin can be useful in treating uh, addictions, in this case, tobacco addiction. And they found that one year later, after the person taking one high dose of psilocybin with psychotherapy, that half of their sample had, had managed to abstain from smoking for a year. For a year later, it's one of the most successful nicotine treatment programs ever. Um, Tobacco, on the other hand, kills hundreds of thousands of people every year, is legally available if you're over 16, and doesn't help you get off your other addictions. Now, is there something wrong with that picture? I can't quite get my head around the, 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 the anomaly there, but there's something strange with that situation. Now, the other thing about the psychedelics is they have low dependency risks as well. That means they're not addictive. Uh, I'll put in a caveat, some of them are. Uh, things like ketamine, we call that a psychedelic can be addictive. Um, a colleague of mine was giving a lecture to a psychology audience on uh, about ayahuasca. Has anyone here heard of ayahuasca? Yep. Yeah. Oh, I thought you might have done. And um, <laughs> he's been researching it for years, an anthropologist, and he was giving this lecture and he said, and somebody put their hand up and said, but aren't these substances addictive? And he said, oh no, I would know, I've taken it thousands of times. <laughs> uh, and it's quite right, it's not addictive. You just keep taking it, it's great. Uh, 
they're, they're, they're not technically thought to be addictive. In fact, they can be used to treat other addictions uh, with, with great success, as we'll come to. Now, this is quite curious, um, because one of the reasons these drugs are illegal in the first place under the classification is that they have a no no medical value, which they do, obviously in treating addictions and other psychogenic disorders, and B, that they're addictive, uh, and they're not addictive. So, you know, they shouldn't ever really be classified under those conditions anyway. Now, one of the, the, the genuine potential side effects or pitfalls of psychedelic substances are what's called hallucinogen persisting perceptual disorder. If you can say that fast, you're not tripping. Um, <laughs> Uh, so that is a condition whereby, you know, the drugs should wear off, uh, but you're still having perceptual distortions. Um, and that could be anything from, you know, seeing groovy colours to having full-blown synesthesia. Does anyone know what synesthesia is? It's a con uh, an ordinary condition in some people where you, by you have a blending of your senses. So you may taste shapes or see sounds. Uh, so I'm very interested in synesthesia. I've been studying it experimentally with psychedelics. And I've got three case studies currently of people who took massive recreational doses, accidentally overdosed, and uh, are still tripping effectively. Uh, seven years later or more, they still have experiences, so they still have synesthesia on an everyday permanent basis. Now, all of them found that quite tricky for the first couple of years, now to go and hide for about two years before they could deal with the outside world again. But now they quite <coughs> like it. Uh, so it's been kind of very useful, some of them, in making music and art, as you can probably imagine. But that is a genuine risk. We, we find it's very rare in clinical uses where we're giving out a known dosage, but occasionally people take very large recreational doses and they may not stop tripping, effectively. Um, there's some survey data, which we don't know how sound it is, but it would suggest it's, it's much less than 1% of the population, about 0.1% of recreational users, at least those responding to this survey, reported having uh, persistent experiences or flashbacks, uh, but very few of them saw medical help. Okay, looking at the medical uses then, so what are the potential uses of, of, of psychedelics? And, and they were primarily used, as we said, in the 50s, initially as mimics of psychosis, but then they began developed as treatments in their own right. Uh, and, you know, the Sandals Laboratories who was making LSD in Switzerland would, would give out free samples of LSD to psychiatrists and psychologists to work with them. And they started using them in therapy. And two modes of therapy started up in that time. One was called psychedelic psychotherapy. So they typically give very high doses on a one-to-one -one session and probably one or maybe two sessions. So very short-term, quick, high dosage, one-to-one uh, -one sessions of, of psychotherapy. The other type that emerged in, in mostly in Europe was called psycholytic psychotherapy, and they would tend to give much lower doses uh, over long periods of time, like you know repeated uh, psychotherapy, and often in groups as well. And that was kind of the method that was favoured in the UK, and that was actually the first type of, of psychedelic therapy which was introduced and started in 1952. So the idea of, of, of psychedelic psychotherapy is that they have advantages uh, for the, the clinician or therapist in that they enable a disinhibition. The person can you know, open up, have a loosening of the ego, uh, have access to unconscious material. And if you're thinking in kind of Jungian terms, that is you know, what you're after. And you can maybe get to, to that through word association or dreams. But the beauty of, of psychedelics was you have access to unconscious material right there and then live in, in therapy. Uh, it could also give access to repressed memories, and the therapist could work through with them in real time. So the therapy itself is typically non-directive. The therapist would be there more as a sitter, they'll allow the person to have the experience and just guide them through it. Um, so alternating between their inner focus and talking to the therapist, uh, and they were allowed to just express whatever came up. Uh, obviously it's important you know, about setting setting, you make it very no handcuffs or you know being locked in a room certainly in these conditions and typically it would be um, escorted by kind of evocative substance uh, circumstances substances like uh, music or uh, maybe breath work or maybe kind of encouraging people to go inwards with kind of eye shades and then afterwards and this is important there'll be an integration 
session as well. So as much as set and setting are as, are as important as substance, uh, for the kind of experience you'll have, integration is the kind of fourth component, is, is important for ensuring that people leave the experience in a way in which it, they can make sense of it and they're not just completely blown apart and, and left raw. And then that's kind of currently a bit of an issue. People going off to South America in their droves, for ayahuasca tourism, going to a retreat center in Iquitos or wherever, taking ayahuasca, getting blown open, having loads of psychological material coming up, but not necessarily knowing what to do with it afterwards. Uh, and, and may not have the kind of sufficient integration to enable them to make sense of it or kind of re-compartmentalize all those experiences and enable them to function uh, in their life. So um, we talk more about that later. Uh, so the history of, of, of uh, psychedelic psychotherapy, you know, people like Ronald David Lane is very important. You've probably heard about him who's working here in London. He had a very kind of freestyle approach. He was one of the kind of anti-psychiatrists. And, you know, he let people just roam around in a kind of essentially an open lunatic asylum and everyone had free access to LSD and even DMT. And he said the important thing for psychoanalysis was that first of all, you read the works of Freud, you undergo personal analysis and take LSD. And he thought that was important for becoming a good psychoanalyst. Um, Humphrey Osmond here on the left, of course, was, was a, a British psychiatrist who came up with the word psychedelic in communication with um, Albus Huxley, the famous writer. Um, so in 1952, psychedelic psychotherapy started in, in the UK, actually, by a guy called Ronald Sanderson, a psychiatrist. And he set up a unit at Worcestershire hospital doing psycholytic psychotherapy, group psychotherapy, and he was doing that for many years. Uh, so one of the things that the, some of the earliest um, psychiatrists, Humphrey Osmond and himself, and John Smith, his two psychiatrists from London, went out to Saskatchewan in, the, in about 1950 in Canada. Uh, they were given a kind of use for a clinic. And so anyone who knows about Canada and Saskatchewan, it's a kind of massive open prairie uh, there isn't many people there, there's not much to do, and they have very high incidence of alcoholism. And so they tried using psychedelics to treat alcoholism <coughs> because they figured it could mimic those conditions under which people have a spontaneous remission from uh, alcohol addiction. And that's when people have the, when they kind of, they stop drinking, for whatever reason they can't get any access to alcohol, and they have delirium tremens, which can be fatal. I and mean, then in some cases, people have a kind of profound uh, what they call organic psychosis or kind of mystical like experiences and they, they have a kind of breakthrough experience and they realise you know, the, what damage they're doing to themselves and their families and so on and they're able to then stop drinking so they figured like, by giving people psychedelics it could mimic this kind of really cataclysmic event for them in a, in a safe way unlike delirium tremens and so they start treating alcoholics with, with mescaline and LSD uh, with quite a lot of success so there's been a recent meta-analysis where they gathered up all the studies from the past that had, had looked at the, the efficacy of, of LSD for treating alcoholism, and they found that overall that, that it was an efficacious treatment for treating alcohol addiction. Uh, more and more of these reviews popping up all the time, and it's like been used for treating all kinds of addictions, uh, such as uh, cocaine, um, crack, heroin, and so on, uh, whether it's ketamine or uh, iboga, or LSD or psilocybin. Uh, so these things appear to have great potential in treating addiction. It's a bit like fighting fire with fire. Um, now the other thing about psychedelics that have been used for therapeutically is for intransigent psychogenic disorders. Uh, you know, psychiatry currently is in crisis, right? All of the areas of medicine have advanced primarily through technological advances and biological discoveries and so on and so forth. Psychiatry hasn't really made much progress really. Um, in, in treating conditions. Uh, you know, SSRIs are not particularly effective. Certainly, there's a massive placebo effect in their effects. Um, and so psychiatry is in crisis, and yet we know these substances have great potential in treating psychogenic disorders like depression, anxiety, addictions, even things like uh, anxiety conditions like obsessive compulsive disorder. There's been a pilot study looking at that with great success. And the use of things like MDMA, i.e. ecstasy, that's well, not, but you know, that's what I call it, uh, to treat post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and it seems to be very effective in that. That's one of the, the drugs that has advanced the furthest in its move towards being licensed as, as a kind of genuine 
medical treatment or intervention. And that's because the MDMA allows people to access these memories, which are traumatic, in a way which doesn't immediately give a fear response, which is what people who have PTSD have around traumatic memories. They can't even talk about it in therapy. And so there, there's a lot of progress going forward in, in finding, using MDMA in treating post-traumatic stress disorder. One of the other avenues has been the use of psychedelics in treating patients with cancer, not to treat the cancer, although I, there are some to find anti-tumor properties in some psychedelics, that's a whole other story, but to treat the anxiety and depression associated with having a terminal illness. So people are stage four cancer, they come towards the end of their life, that's quite a heavy trip in itself, you know, people have difficulty dealing with that, they have a lot of fear around death, uh, they have a lot of depression and anxiety, and there's been uh, several studies, some done in the 60s, some have been replicating that again now, and they're finding it's very useful in alleviating people's fear of death. Consequently, their depression and anxiety is also reduced, and um, consequently, people need to take less painkilling medication as they near the end of life. And then incidentally, people also tend to live a bit longer as well, but that wasn't the purpose. So people find that they're better prepared for death. <coughs> they have left fear of it, and they're more able to have an easy and more ready death uh, through, even in some cases in the studies, just one high-dose treatment with psilocybin and some psychotherapy. Now, why is that? Uh, and a lot of it seems to be due to the mystical experiences that people have, and I'll come back to that. So there's oodles of studies underway. This is actually massively out of date. Uh, this will just give you a flavour of it. So there's MDMA studies popping up all over the world for PTSD, um, use of psilocybin for treating various addictions and end-of-life cancer, uh, use of Iboga as treating addictions, and so on and so forth. The list of things, psychological conditions, that psychedelics seem to have some use in treating, it seems to be never-ending. They're somewhat of a, a psychological panacea. And they may also have some uses in treating physiological disorders as well. In the UK, we're a bit behind the curve. Most of that research is in the States. There's some studies going on now, uh, been going for about the last seven or eight years. I've been involved in the ones in red. Um, and there's new ones popping up all the time. So this really is a kind of expanding field of research. So, now I've kind of touched on this. So what, what is the difference between psychedelics and other drugs, however, though? Is this just pure pharmacotherapy? Um, now, if it was, if it was like traditional drug therapy, you could just prescribe the patient the drug, maybe monitor them, give them the drug again later. I mean, that's how most drug therapy is done. But the thing about psychedelics is that it's psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. So you have to have some psychotherapy with the psychedelics. It's, it's not psychotherapy alone, it's not the drug either. It's, it's both of them combined. Uh, and that seems to be important, which, which kind of confuses a lot psychopharmacologists, you know, how do you kind of categorise these things? Um, and one of the important things that all of these, all the studies that have looked at, at it have found that the important thing is the kind of experience that people have. So in those cases where people have a peak or mystical experience, we find that they have much better outcomes, be it end-of-life cancer or nicotine addiction. So if you categorise, if you look at those people who have a certain cut-off point for having a full mystical experience, those that have the full mystical experience will have significantly better prognosis and outcomes than those people who don't have a mystical experience. So the actual experience that the people are having themselves is hugely important. So it's not just pure pharmacological intervention, and hence the need for psychotherapy as well. So think of it like this, you know, a standard kind of psychotherapy experience you kind of, it kicks in, you have a, it, it peaks and then it kind of reduces, you have an afterglow, and then there are residual effects. In some cases, a year or two years later, maybe even 25 years later in one study. Um, however, those people that have the peak experience, so-called the mystical experience, are those who have the best outcomes. What do we mean by peak or mystical experience? <laughs> this is a tricky bit. Um, I mean, one of the definitions of a mystical experience is it's ineffable, right? That means you can't put it into words. So I'm going to use a little graph. <laughs> Maybe a bit like that. Without the beard. Um, so what do we know about mystical experiences? I mean, this was a kind of uh, an issue of, of, of great debate in the 1960s. 
And you know, all these people started taking psychedelics and they're saying now having spiritual and religious experiences. And various theologians say, oh no, that's total rubbish. You know, you can't have a, an experience, a spiritual, a genuine spiritual experience with a drug. That's just cheating. I mean, they didn't like the idea of it, let alone, you know, the, the notion of it. So um, there's a famous experiment do, done at Harvard by a contemporary of Timothy Leary, a guy called Walter Panke. He was an extremely um, sort of prolific and overqualified young character. I mean, by the time he was 30, he was a medical doctor, a consultant psychiatrist, a theologian, uh, he'd done a PhD in theology as well, all at Harvard uh, at a very young age. And he did this famous experiment, a Good Friday experiment, when they tried to settle the argument about whether or not drugs can give you a genuine mystical experience. And they took 20 theologians, theology students at Harvard, and uh, they put them in a Good Friday experiment. So they put them in a, a church, and they piped in a little chapel next to the church, they piped through the Good Friday Mass, about three-hour Mass, and they gave half of them randomly psilocybin. And then they gave them all this questionnaire about whether or not they'd had mystical experience afterwards under kind of blind conditions. And guess what? You know, they all, let's define the first one. <laughs> Pretty much all of them had a mystical experience. And they defined that by uh, various measures which looked at their sense of unity, their transcendence of time and space, a deeply felt positive mood, a sense of sacredness, uh, objectivity and reality, that the experience felt more real than real, that it had inherent paradoxicality. It didn't make sense, but it made sense. Uh, an alleged ineffability, you couldn't actually describe it, but it was transient as well. And also that it had positive changes in attitude and behaviour, i.e. long-term changes. And of course, by their measures, they found pretty much all of those indices were, were significant in those people who'd had the psilocybin and put in the church mass on Good Friday. So that seemed to settle the argument. There was even a, a long-term follow-up study 25 years later by Rick Donnelly, who set up uh, MAPS. Has anyone heard of MAPS? It's an institute in the States called Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, which has been kind of uh, funding psychedelic research for the last 30 years or so. And he, he did a follow-up, actually, and he managed to track down uh, something like 16 of the original participants in that study 25 years later. Uh, and of uh, nine controls and seven ex experimental conditions, nine out of ten of those who'd been in experimental condition were still active in the ministry, compared to only half of those in the control condition, if that says anything. Uh, but what they also said was that all of them felt, 25 years later, that it was still one of the most profound spiritual experiences of their life. And these are people who are working in the ministry. They, didn't, they hadn't kind of gone around, oh no, I was just high as a kite. It was like, no, this was a really profound and genuine mystical spiritual experience. Now the argument kind of hung there for a while until John Hopkins University very recently got interested in this and decided they were gonna replicate it. So this is a kind of very run of the mill kind of uh, department of psychopharmacology that were doing standard approved studies on drug addiction, things like caffeine and effect. And they, they just a professor before he retired decided he was gonna replicate the Good Friday experiment, which he did with kind of bells on, basically. Uh, I won't go into all the details. But he basically found the same thing. Um, something like two thirds of it, his sample reported a complete mystical experience after one psilocybin session. And uh, two thirds of them said it was the single most, or in the top five, most meaningful experiences of their lives, compared to only 8% of the people in the control condition. It's interesting that anybody in the control condition said this was the most mystical important meaningful experience of their life. I mean, they were just getting high on the music and the eye shades. It shows the power of placebo. But you know, by far and away, two thirds of the people in, in the experimental condition said it was the most meaningful experience of their life, or the top five. To put that into context, they were comparing that to the birth of their first child, or a death of, uh, of a parent. Okay, that's how meaningful it was. Um, and they also did a follow-up study, and they found that people, uh, something like 14 months later, and they found that the people's uh, measures on the mysticism scale hadn't changed. They were still the same. 14 months later, they still felt it was this kind of really profound experience. Um, they also looked at long-term positive changes in, in mood and effect, and they found that they were still elevated 14 months later. Not only by self-report, they asked their family and their friends and their colleagues is this person much nicer and happier than they were before? And they all agreed. So even by uh, peer report, 
these people had profound positive changes over a year later. Um, so yeah, as Panky said himself, you know, the, the, the substances are necessary but not sufficient um, for a mystical experience. And set and setting is important. So you know, they put these people in a conducive environment for a mystical experience. In the original Good Friday experiment, they were in church, they were theology students. In the, in the replication study at John Hopkins University, they were all spiritual practitioners, but they weren't in the church. They were in a kind of nice, cosy room. Nevertheless, they had a high incidence rate of mystical experiences. A survey by a guy called Wolf reckons that about 25% of casual users will have a mystical experience on their first trip. So you get a sense of the power of certain setting. Nevertheless, a large proportion of people are still having profound mystical experiences regardless of the certain setting. Okay, so I'm going to move on to a bit uh, more of the kind of what do we mean by mystical experience? Um, uh, this guy here, Stan Groff, was kind of quite important in this whole story as well. He's a, he was a Czech psychiatrist and uh, he moved to the States. He started doing psychedelic psychotherapy. He wrote a great book called LSD Psychotherapy. Um, does what it says in the packet. And that was based on his observations of over 20 years of doing this therapy, uh, in which he conducted over 4,000 psychedelic assisted therapy sessions. Um, and what he noticed from doing that work was that people would have <coughs> extraordinary experiences on a daily basis. He said he reported observing past life recall, out of body experiences, ESP, things like precognition, accurate remote viewing, and space time travel on a daily basis. This is an occupational hazard. <laughs> All the therapists at the time of the 1960s also reported people having these experiences. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean these experiences are real, but people are having the experiences. Saying that, even Groff himself said in, in, in some of the cases it was undeniable people were having uh, what looked like telepathy or clairvoyance because they were telling him things about himself that they shouldn't know, for instance. Um, so Groff observed these things kind of quite regularly and he, he decided to catalogue them and classify them. He said there was 45, kind of, 45 different types of experience which could put into three categories in kind of ascending order of mind blowingness, if you like. And the first type of the experiential extension within space-time and consensus reality. So these are just kind of really far out experiences, but they don't defy anything we know about the laws of science. So, you know, maybe planetary consciousness or embryonal, fetal and phylogenetic experiences. You know, maybe kind of going, feeling, experiencing what it's like to be every one of your... Uh, genetic ancestors, maybe go all the way back to primordial looms. You know, those kind of experiences that you have on the way into work on the books or whatever, you know, <laughs> everyday events. So these are kind of obviously extremely mind-blowing experiences, but, you know, they could just be very elaborate um, activation of one's own imagination. Uh, so they don't defy anything we know about consensus reality. The second type, however, which is where I've done most of my research, and those experiences which at face value look like they do go beyond space-time and consensus reality. So things like uh, telepathic experiences or uh, cosmic consciousness and so on. Third category we don't really see very often at all, so I should probably disregard them, and they are kind of the most far out. And that's what we call transgressive experiences of a psychoid nature. As we know about Jung earlier, it's borrowed a term from Jung. And that's where one's... Uh, Experiences of the mind begin to manifest externally. They become externalised. So we include, as Jung did, things like uh, UFO encounters, which Jung thought were kind of psych psychological experiences manifest in one's external world. So Groff did a lot of big job of doing that. And that's where a lot of my research lies. I, 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 I research what I call exceptional human experiences. Uh, and so I'm going backwards. Uh, no, I'm not there we go. And so over the last 12 years, I've been publishing papers and doing experiments and collecting data and doing reviews on several areas of, of, of experience with psychedelics. Things like synesthesia, extra-dimensional percepts, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, entity encounters, alien abduction, sleep paralysis, interspecies communication, possession, and psi, which is telepathy, precognition, clairvoyance, and psychokinesis. Psychokinesis, if you don't know, is the direct effect of one's mind on matter. So anybody here believes in psychokinesis, raise my arm. 
So quarter nick year, I haven't got time to go into all of that. Uh, but conveniently, or inconveniently, oh, I put it all together in a book which came out very recently, which you can get a hold of, called, uh, what's it called? Oh, Other World, Psychedelics and Exceptional Human Experience. There's 12 words, years of research, jump into one little juicy book. That's the plug over. Um, no, actually, I might come back to that. No, that's the plug over. Um, so these kind of experiences are kind of grist of the mill. These are kind of the daily fodder of people we might call shamans. Now, shamans, if you don't know, are, well, it's, a, it's, a kind of, it's, a, it's a, a term that only really applies to people from the Tungus tribe in Siberia. But anthropologists and other people have used this word to apply to people, magico-spiritual practitioners who do certain things in a certain way. Uh, and it always involves altered state. So a definition of a shaman might be somebody goes into altered state of consciousness at will in the name of their community to transcend space and time and bring back useful information. <coughs> and also do some healing. And we find these people all over the world. So for instance, I've been working with the Reach Owl. They actually call themselves the Guadalica, but no one can say that. Uh, Indians of, of Mexico make use of peyote cactus. All of these different tribes use these substances to transcend space and time and bring back information. Maztec, uh, Indians also in Mexico, where we get psilocybin mushrooms from, where they first discovered using it in 1953. Or uh, Tungus Shans, Siberia, make use of this Amanita mushroom, the red and white one, which has gone to a fashion sense. Uh, <laughs> maybe use of Datura in India, or uh, Pachuri in Australia, or Iboga in Africa, or Syrian Rue in Syria, or ayahuasca or plethora of other psychoactive neurohacking cocktails in the Amazon. All over the world we find the use of these substances. Um, take ayahuasca for instance, you know, people, this is kind of hot on topic, people are going out to the Amazon in, in their droves and people are coming back and saying, you know, hey what, I went out there, I had diabetes or I had depression or whatever it was and now I'm fine. Uh, not everybody but a lot of people are. Now we don't know if this is spontaneous remission or this is kind of genuinely, or some kind of placebo effect because there hasn't been many clinical controlled randomized drug trials of ayahuasca. There has just been the first one done on depression with positive results, so that's paving the way for other studies. But people who, who drink ayahuasca, we talk to ayahuasqueros, people who do this uh, as part of their cultural tradition, you know, they talk about uh, having these kind of intense experiences. People will see very colorful, Scenes maybe kind of jaguars are quite prevalent, and it's said you know that the, the spirit of the shaman is, is, is seen as a jaguar. Uh, snakes are also very prevalent in ayahuasca experiences, uh, which is thought to represent the spirit of the, of the plant itself. And in my research, something like 70% of the people who take ayahuasca in my surveys have said they encounter what they experience as the spirit or intelligence of the plant itself. So it's a very common experience. Um, it's not always a serpent, though. Uh, however, the serpent had become synonymous with ayahuasca experiences, so much so that people going to South America now, if they don't see snakes, they want their money back. It's true. I've heard people at the tree centre say, yeah, they didn't get the snakes, they want their money back. You know, they feel cheated. Um, you don't always get snakes. Um, so how is it that people come to, 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 if they are getting better, how is it that this is enacted? It could be spontaneous remission, it could be some kind of uh, hypnotic suggestion or placebo effect, and you know, these are the kind of the explanations which are, 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 are kind of favoured within the kind of current scientific medical establishment. Alternatively, it could be that there's some kind of uh, psychopharmacological action going on there, or you know, pharmacological <coughs> action going on. Uh, do research looking into how you know, depression is maybe reduced through reduction of activity in the frontal lobes with psychedelics. Um, things like ayahuasca, uh, the vine is thought to have uh, neurogenetic properties, uh, anti-tumor properties, anti-inflammatory properties, we're now discovering autoimmune modulation properties. So there are some physiological effects which we haven't really yet fully discovered. But if you talk to people, a lot of it is to do with the psychological experience. You know, people will have a, a, an aha or revelatory kind of experience, like William Blake, <coughs> his painting Revelation, 
whereby they, they maybe kind of relive some kind of trauma, trauma or early, any kind of trauma and, and, and just have an insight into how their psychological condition is giving rise to a physiological illness. And that in itself, you know, cathartically can be curative. Um, but it gets much weirder than that. You know, shamans talk about, as do people who take ayahuasca, talk about seeing inside bodies. You know, they'll, they'll say they can see uh, organs, uh, and they'll be able to diagnose a person's illness, or they can see cells, or they can go down even further and say they can see DNA, which sounds completely bonkers, obviously, uh, to our Western minds. Um, as it did to um, Jeremy Narby, the anthropologist, I'm going to tell you a quick anecdote here, and I'll open it up to some questions, but maybe. Actually, I'm going to carry on with it. <laughs> but Jeremy Narby, a, a, being a good at Western kind of medically trained anthropologist, he was out in the Amazon, he was studying this tribe called the Ashen Inca, and uh, he thought, you know, he was, he was studying what they knew about the plants in the forest. He wanted to show that they knew how to resource their, their environment well so that loggers wouldn't come and chop it down. Um, and he found that they knew a lot about all the plants in the forest. And, and when he talked to them, you know, they said, well, how do you know this plant does this? And he said, oh, you know, ayahuasca, the, the plants told us. And they were like, yeah, whatever. They thought they were really nice people and they knew a lot of stuff, but he thought they were a bit bonkers because they had all these weird magical beliefs. Then they invited him to drink ayahuasca with them one day. And so he did, he, he stepped over that divide that anthropologists weren't supposed to do. And, he went native, he drank ayahuasca, and then he changed his entire worldview. He didn't think they were bonkers anymore. He thought they were more sane than he was. Um, and he said that you know, there was this high incidence of people seeing these double helix serpents, so much so that he you know, suggested that were actually seeing DNA. And he wrote this kind of controversial book called The Cosmic Serpent, DNA, The Origins of Knowledge. So he put forward this idea that ayahuasca shamans in the Amazon are actually seeing DNA, and that's symbolised as these double helix serpents, which we see in a lot of old folklore and mythology everywhere in the world, in fact. Um, now, it sounds like a totally untestable, bonkers idea, until you know that this man here on the left, Carrie Mullis, uh, is a biochemist, receiving his Nobel Prize from the King of Sweden, uh, I think in the 90s, for his discovery of PCR, polymerase chain reaction, which is a very important process, in, in our kind of what we understand about genetics these days, it allows you to, to take a single strand of DNA and replicate it, and therefore it gives rise to kind of genome mapping and sequencing and all this kind of stuff. So it was hugely important. He got a Nobel Prize for it, and then afterwards he said, Well, basically, I've taken loads of LSD. And I was like, Are you going to fly alongside the strands of the DNA at a molecular level, see what was going on? True story. Um, obviously, he said this after he got his Nobel Prize. <laughs> Uh, but it's also said, probably, well, apocryphally, that uh, the man on the right, Francis Crick, uh, was under the influence of LSD after he'd stolen you know, his, the data from Rosalind Franklin and was able to kind of determine from the data the, the DNA, double helix structure of DNA itself, um, under the influence of LSD. And that's what's been said. Now, that story only came out after his death, so we can't verify it with Crick unless we get a medium in. But that's a whole other bit of research. Um, but we do know that in his lifetime he did like LSD, and he said he would sue anybody who, who kind of reported this in the news at the time. And I had this on good authority from a friend of his who, who set up an organisation with him that he used to put on these kind of masked balls at his house with balls of LSD punch at the door. So he was definitely a big LSD fan. Whether or not he had taken it in 1953 uh, when he discovered the double helix uh, structure. We don't know, uh, but it is possible. Especially seeing as LSD had entered the country in 1952. Uh, but it's apocryphal, we don't really know. It's a good yarn though, it's too good to miss out on. So is it actually possible to have uh, an experience of seeing things on a molecular level? Well, not by opponent Western scientific thinking, but it could well be an extension of, of a person's active imagination, uh, stimulated by psychedelics based on a wealth of intellectual learning about the things you're experiencing, um, which give rise to experiences of being able to see inside bodies and cells and DNA. We don't really know, but we do know that these substances probably are useful in stimulating uh, the imagination and human creativity. Um, so you, know, you might know who this is. We made a few kind of important objects or, of, of the last uh, 
few decades. Uh, Steve Jobs, of course, and of course he took LSD in the 60s, as did most of everybody in the home computing industry. And he said, doing LSD was one of the two or three most important things that I've done in my life. Presumably, you know, Apple was up there with, with LSD and maybe his family, we don't really know, but it was important to him. And so he had this kind of uh, a double persona, uh, as did, in fact, the whole of the home computing industry in the States. We wouldn't have Macs and Microsoft and all this kind of stuff if it wasn't for psychedelics, probably, or they'd come much later, or they'd look different. There's a great book called What the Doorman Said. It said how the whole home computing industry, everybody was taking psychedelics, and that's how it came about. Um, who's the other one? Not Steve Jobs. Uh, is it Microsoft? Bill Gates. Bill Gates, yeah, that's it. Bill Gates also took LSD. Uh, Steve Jobs said he didn't take enough, or his products would have been better. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably right. Um, but it wasn't just the home computing industry. Uh, there was a whole branch of, of physics called quantum cryptography, which came out of a bunch of out-of-work physicists who got together and took loads of acid and, and, and worked on theoretical physics because they couldn't get the grants to do kind of lab-based physics. And now quantum cryptography is like a multi-billion dollar industry. There was some research done at the time, uh, the only study of its kind, where they looked at kind of creativity in top level professionals in science and engineering and architecture. They gave them nestling and they got them to work on one of their own inherent kind of research problems. And, um, you know, they tested them after the mescaline. Uh, they, most of them said it opened up new avenues of investigation. They attempted numerous novel problems. Um, on their kind of measures, they all said that there was no, no decrease in any of these indices. En enhanced their ability to solve problems. They were be able to work with people afterwards, they said. It enhanced their attitude towards their job, increased their productivity. They were better able to communicate. And a number of uh, patents, products, or publications came out of that bit of research from the participants. That was one of their indices of success. So things like a mathematical theorem of the null gate circuits, a conceptual model of a proton, a linear electron accelerating beam steering device. We've all got one of those, I don't know what that is. And so on and so forth. So there was a number of novel items which came out of that research, um, which you may not be aware of. I was actually involved in a study where we replicated this study uh, with LSD, uh, with top level scientists uh, in the last couple of years. We haven't published the results yet, so I can't tell you what happened. But we took kind of top level scientists, uh, Oxford, Cambridge, PhDs in physics and maths, people from CERN and NASA, and we gave them LSD for the first time so they could work on their research problems. And you know, all of them at least expressed some kind of positive outcome in terms of having some fresh ideas or outcomes. And there was at least one patent has so far come out of that, but I can't tell you what it is. I'm just going to show you the picture. You can work it out yourselves. If I tell you, I'll have to kill you. Um, the point of this being that creativity uh, can be stimulated through, or creative problem solving, it seems to be kind of stimulated through the use of psychedelics. And it's what we call divergent thinking, particularly. It's that the kind of people have a fresh associations of ideas, probably something to do with the underlying neurochemistry in that different regions of the brain are communicating with each other, they aren't ordinarily talking to each other, and so you have to have ability to kind of think about things in novel ways. That's called divergent thinking. Co conversely, though, we see a reduction in what's called convergent thinking, which is the ability to have normal, logical, linear thinking, and, you know, operate heavy machinery and get on the bus and that kind of stuff, which doesn't get enhanced by the use of psychedelics. In fact, most of our scientists couldn't operate their own laptops when they tried. Um, but they did have lots of great ideas. The point about that in terms of mental health is I think you can look at creativity as a kind of polar opposite of mental health problems. Uh, you know, I think creative, if you are creative and being creative, A, it's an indices of, of mental health, and it's also probably somewhat of an antidote to it as well. Uh, and I'll let you discuss that. I haven't got any hard evidence. It's just a kind of intuition. What we also found is that related to creativity, they found that long-term changes in personality through the use of psychedelics. Uh, but certainly in one study, the use of psilocybin, they found that one high dose of psilocybin induced enduring changes in personality in the domain of openness. It's called, uh, so we, like, we, psychologists, we kind of, we kind of uh, create these kind of artificial constructs about your personality and give them names. 
And one of the main domains is called openness to experience. It's thought to be a very positive personality dimension. It's related to creativity, your tendency to engage in novel activities, you know, absorb culture, make stuff, do art, and all the rest of it. They found that this was the only personality variable that changed after one high dose of psilocybin. Even long term, over a year later, they found increases in the domain of personality in those people who had a mystical experience. Now, those people who didn't have a kind of what they defined as a mystical experience didn't have significant increases in, in openness to experience. Uh, and you, so you can see how this is related both to mental health and to creativity. Um, but you can also see how the psychological experience and not just the biological effect is key. Those people have mystical experiences, as with people in nicotine treatment studies, as with people in end-of-life cancer studies, those who have mystical experience have the best outcomes. Uh, there's a few other things I should say, that, and I looked to touch on this already, there are some possible physiological dimensions to psychedelics which are only now being explored, which we really didn't know about in the 60s. Most of the research um, we're doing now is just repeating what we did in the 60s with better science, finding that they're useful in treating psychogenic disorders like addictions, depression, anxiety, and so on. But we're also finding physiological effects. So there are immune system modulators, some of them have anti tumor properties, um, some of them have high anti inflammatory indexes. So things like anxiety and depression, neurodegenerative diseases are now thought to be linked to inflammation. And psychedelics seem to be able to reduce inflammation. So we've got a physiological mechanism there potentially as well. But also in production of new brain cells. So up until a few years ago, neurogenesis wasn't thought to occur, i.e. that you generate new brain cells in adulthood. We now know that you do, parts of the brain, <coughs> and it's linked to things like BDNF and enzyme, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is elevated through psychedelics, such as iboga, psilocybin, ketamine and cannabis. And also, a recent study with harmaline, which is ayahuasca, from ayahuasca, they actually found in vitro uh, increases in neurogenesis, just looking at individual cells. So that has obviously implications for neurogenitive diseases and also possibly for psychological conditions like depression. It allows people to rewire their mental circuitry, develop new kind of memory traces, etc., etc. positive ones. Um, one final dimension is a bit abstract, called eco-psychogenesis, just made that up, uh, is well, what about the sense in which people are become more ecologically uh, conscious, become more ecologically minded or orientated. And I think this is also important. There's a branch of transpersonal psychology or uh, psychotherapy called eco-psychology. And the main purpose of this eco-psychology is nature as therapy. Right? Nature itself can help us heal and get well. And that uh, illness is essentially about our alienation from nature. A lot of psychological, psychiatric conditions are at least massively influenced by urbanisation. Schizophrenia, psychosis, depression are much higher in urban, in urban environments. We passed the tipping point a couple of years ago where there's more people on the planet living in urban environments than living in rural environments. We have mega cities with over 30 million inhabitants. Depression in London is running at about 30% of the workforce. Okay? These are urban diseases and it's about alienation from nature. Now the interesting thing is, well, what role does psychedelics play in that? So I did a survey of psychedelic users, and I asked them, so how have your psychedelic experiences changed how much you interact with nature? Um, a very tiny percent said they interact less with nature, having taken psychedelics. The vast majority, about two thirds, said they interact much more with nature, having had psychedelic experiences. So you can get people outside, digging holes, playing with worms, <laughs> climbing trees, swimming in rivers, whatever. That's useful. <coughs> How about their uh, connection and concern? We found that 100% of people who taken psychedelics had an increased connection to nature. So they felt more connected to nature. 100% of people who taken psychedelics said they felt more connected from their experiences. And from an ecological perspective, not a psychological perspective, Two thirds of them had an increased concern for nature as well. Um, I also tried to identify, like top of the pops, what's the most kind of ecologically conscious psychedelic substance someone can take. 
and it turned out with psilocybin mushrooms. About half of the people taking them had said their concern, the connection had increased. Uh, ketamine was way down at the bottom, it actually had the opposite effect, just so in case you know. And I also looked at the knock on effect for, for our ecology and our, our ecological interaction. Um, you know, there is an adage that to heal ourselves, we need to heal nature. Right? And that's the kind of one of the root underlying premises of eco psychology as well. We're living in an ecological disaster, in case you haven't noticed. We're in the biggest wave of mass extinction in 40 million years and by some estimates will have killed off all the other species in less than 100 years. So it's quite important that we actually have an environment to live in. Um, and that can be beneficial for one's own mental health as well. So how did those uh, changes in attitude transpose into changes in behaviour? We found that two thirds of people were more aware of ecological issues. More than half of our sample changed their diet, which is going to have health benefits as well. They became vegetarian, vegan, raw, whatever. Um, more than half of them increased gardening. Can you imagine that? Extraordinary. Psychedelics make you, turns you into a gardener. <laughs> Headline, flash. Um, but also that we have people joined organisations, they donated money and adopted animals. Perhaps the most important one was that 16% of people in my survey changed their career having had psychedelic experiences to one that was more ecologically orientated. To give you two examples, Two of, my people, two of the people in the sample quit what they were doing and took up PhDs in botany, uh, yeah, having had psychedelic experiences. So the potential uses for these things from a psychological perspective are ever-growing, uh, like kind of flowering plants in your mind. That was a really kind of nap poetic end. I was trying to find some way of ending it. So let's leave it there. Thank you very much. I'll have some questions. So I wanted to say thank you so much for your talk. Um, obviously, everybody's very excited about the topic. And I've been to some conferences in New York through MAPS. And one of the big issues that they mentioned is, even with all the research that's happening in the US, the big problem that they're getting is, for instance, the uh, study with MDMA and PTSD. It was a factor, I think, of five or seven um, efficacy, where after three doses, the patient was theoretically cured. They no longer had the symptoms. And so when they presented it to the FDA, they said, come back with more studies. You haven't proved it yet. And uh, what they are finding is basically you're taking away um, patients from the psychopharmacology um, corporations where you can say we can cure you in three doses or you can be on anti-anxiety, antidepressants for the rest of your life. So you're either taking 365 doses times 30 years or three doses. And so they're coming up against um, business, basically saying, we can't make money off of treatment that works. So I don't know if the same thing is happening here, but in your experience, what could be done to address the corporate interests when the studies show by far the efficacy rates, but then you don't have a population that is paying money every day for drugs? Did everyone hear the question, more or less? Yeah. Oh, good. That's good. Thank you for repeating it. Um, so we're talking about like psychedelics or MDMA in this case being a victim of their own success in that they're too effective, and so the pharmaceutical industry a isn't interested in in developing them because the pharmaceutical industry to be cynical, you know, have to make profit, and uh, it's no point making drugs which seemingly cure people after three doses. Uh, you wouldn't sell many drugs. So that's one of the reasons why the pharmacological industry isn't particularly interested in, in, in developing these things as treatments. Uh, they're not. Uh, they haven't put any money into it. Um, the money's only coming from philanthropy at the minute. It's just kind of people putting their hands in their pockets and saying, I believe in the potential of these substances to treat people, I'm going to donate money to the cause. They're not getting money from governments either, particularly. Um, they did donate half a million quid to one study at Imperial, looking at depression. But it's very, very difficult to get mainstream governmental funding for this and no pharmaceutical money. Now, the other point you're saying is, well, actually, it's a competition for them as well. Well, at this point, potentially, you know, maybe, you mean, the actual psychiatric drug market out of the whole pharmaceutical industry is tiny. It's about less than 1% of 
of the whole pharmaceutical industry is for psychiatric drugs. I mean, I'm a few psychiatric drugs which don't really do much and make a lot of money for those who make it. Um, to be cynical. So, I mean, there's potentially some conflicts of competition with the pharmaceutical industries, but essentially they're not funding the, the research into developing these substances. And yes, they do seem to be quite efficacious, but it, I mean, it's, it's only a potentially a problem. It's still, the problem is there's no funding to develop these drugs for, re for, for treatments as licensing. So they're having to go through all the usual channels that a pharmaceutical industry would have to to get them licensed, which is you know, phase one, two, three, four, uh, which, is, which are kind of increasingly more expensive as you go through each phase, as you broaden it out to bigger and bigger samples. Um, but they have to do that with, with no hard cash, you know. They have to do it on donations from people like Dr. Bronner's Soaps, which has donated $5 million to the MDMA PTSD study, simultaneously disproving the myth that hippies don't wash as well, which is important. Um, so they're on soft money to do that, and so it, it becomes difficult to do the research. But they are. I mean, uh, MDMA is now in phase three clinical drug trials, which means you've got multi multi site research going on about twenty or thirty different locations, to, in doing independent replications of, of that, which will kind of allow it to get to the next stage of licensing. The rest of the psychedelics are nowhere near that. They're all in the kind of pilot study phase. So MDMA might well be licensed in the next few years, in the next 10 years so. The other psychedelics are unlikely to be licensed for a few more years, actually, because the, 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 to get them licensed, they have to have the clinical trials proving A, that they're safe, and B, that they're effective. And that just hasn't been done yet. Uh, so it's not so much that the pharmaceutical industry are getting in the way of that, they're just not helping. That's the thing, I would say. That's your question. Another question. Um, obviously, um different drugs can treat different disorders, but what about someone who has all of the disorders you're talking about? So someone that has OCD, PTSD, bipolar, schizoaffective disorder, all at once, what do you do for them? If Because these disorders can obviously, you can, they can mix, you can get symptoms. Absolutely. Psychosis coming in with your PTSD and psychotic OCD. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do for someone who has all of these? Yeah, I mean, that's a part, I mean, that's an issue in terms of what's what we call comorbidity, so that you, know, you don't have patients or clients or subjects with just you know, one clear disorder. Often, I mean, that's only really a problem for uh, the treatment, the clinical trials, because they're one person who has specifically this condition and not other conditions. So those are the people with comorbidity who just get left out of clinical trials, typically. <coughs> not necessarily, depends what it is. If it's kind of concomitant, Anxiety, depression, that's also kind of, that's not such a problem. Psychosis is a bit more fun, personality disorders and so on. You probably screen out those people. But um, it doesn't necessarily mean that those things don't treat it anyway, you know. I mean, it, I think the thing about psychedelics is, unlike other drugs, is they seem to be helping people get to the underlying core issues, not just treating symptoms. I mean, psychiatric drugs currently just treat symptoms, you know. They, they're kind of like a band-aid for your mind. Give you side yeah, and give you side effects and, and can be addictive and the maintenance drugs and all the rest of it. Whereas psychedelics, uh, they, they are tools to psychotherapy to root out underlying psychological causes. And if the mystical experience happens to occur in the process, that likely means you have better outcomes as well. Because whatever it is that the mystical experience does, you know, it puts things into perspective, allows people to transcend, kind of, you know, look at things in a, in a broader context, uh, you know. And a bit of, in terms of how it works in, in comorbid conditions, that research hasn't really been done. Although anecdotally, people are saying, you know, it, it fixed this, that, and that, you know. But we don't really know from a scientific perspective if this really is doing that, because that research hasn't been done. So it's only a problem really for clinical research. If people are saying, Oh, it fixed my diabetes and my PTSD and my psychosis. That's good for them. That's great. You could give someone MDMA for their PTSD and then they have a manifestation <coughs> of You could try one for every condition. Yeah. I mean, PTSD is, is particularly amenable to, to MDMA therapy because of its effect on, on the amygdala and then this kind of fear response you have associated with the, with the traumatic experiences. Uh, it's very difficult to 
to have a bad time on MDMA. You know, you can access, it just turns down the activity in the amygdala so that you don't have this, when you, you access that particular traumatic memory, you don't have a total fear response goes with it. And that's quite specific to MDMA. The other psychedelics are a kind of different kind of fish, really. That's a whole other kind of area, yeah. There's another question. You have one down here. Yeah, just following on from the first question. So there's an issue clearly with pharmaceuticals wanting to protect their patients, so it's not so a good thing for them to, to invest in that. But with addiction, currently there seems to be no uh, medic you know, medical cure. Or, or, um, so there so seems to be no sort of medical solution at the moment for addiction, other than maybe following programs. So why... What, what's with the hold up and how far progressed is it because it doesn't seem to have so many barriers in, in terms of it being developed by some kind of pharmaceutical Same kind of issues with uh, addiction treatment. So, you know, there aren't really any pharmacological treatments, well, not kind of cures, but there are maintenance drugs, you know, like methadone is a maintenance drug which makes whatever pharmaceutical companies money because people keep taking it, right? Uh, so again, pharmaceutical industries aren't interested in developing a drug which a person can take one dose or two doses and they, they, don't, they don't need to take any more. Unless you sell that one dose at an extremely high price. Uh, but, it, but alcoholism is one of the biggest um, addictions and that doesn't seem to have a, a, an equivalent of subtext or methadone. Uh, no. No, no, it doesn't. I mean, actually Dave Nurt has been working on What's it, this kind of substitute alcohol stuff and yeah he's been looking at kind of vaccines and stuff like that but I mean that's the thing but the reason why psychedelics aren't being developed for, for addictions or treatment of PTSD or depression or anxiety is because there's no money to be made in developing these drugs right? because if, if you only need to give a person one or two or three treatments yeah. and it's effective or it's not then why would you develop the drug because you just you need a drug you have to people have to keep taking yeah, I understand. I yeah. really enjoyed your talk as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Interesting. We're going to have some questions in the back. You go on, you go for it. He's got the mic, and then we'll just, just to look the zigzag. Just add further to the comments made. The pharmaceutical industry's licensed the product or the like, chemical chemistry is already there. There's nothing new to be invented. So I call it, you know, as the society becomes, you know, complex, you know, we want to all become sort of, what shall I say, quick fix society. We want to pill for every ill. Pharmaceutical industries create ill for every pill. Nice point. Look, can we get a question from the back? Hi. Yeah. Um, so, is there any research being done to um, psychedelics and bipolar? Because you mentioned depression, anxiety, PS, um, post traumatic stress, but not bipolar specifically. And also, if you're looking for a subject, I'm happy to participate. And the message for everyone here um, I'm training to be a shaman, so if you like this, Thank you for that. No, I mean, as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been um, any studies to uh, look at the treatment of bipolar, particularly. Um, it's sort of be a slightly different condition to just major depressive disorder and inherently somewhat more difficult to treat as well. I mean, most of the research is looked at kind of treating everyday depression or major depressive disorder rather than bipolar. Um, but maybe studies will branch out in that department. Yeah, Mudge is yeah, looking at for his PhD thesis, isn't he? And he's, he's, he actually has bipolar disorder and he's been you know, self-treating and he's surveyed people who have also self-medicated um, with ayahuasca to treat their bipolar. Um, but there hasn't been any clinical trials done at this point. So there are, you know, there's kind of a body of kind of survey, or thanks for pointing that out, Amy, of kind of, you know, a collection of anecdotal data. Actually, when anecdotal information, is, as soon as it's published, is no longer anecdotal, it's data. So it's just a kind of collection of, of people who, who self-report that they've treated their bipolar with ayahuasca. But no clinical trials as yet. Maybe we can start one. But you I'm not being a shaman. Thank you. I'm wondering if you ever tried uh, psychedelics yourself? Uh, well, you know, as a scientist, I'd like to answer that question. 
Was there a fam- there was famously, there was an MP, an M- a, a, a Scottish MEP, you know, shortly after the Clinton thing, you know, he said, oh, I never inhaled. The Scottish MEP was asked the same question about cannabis. He said, I never exhaled. <laughs> <laughs> Got elected. Uh, I have, actually. I mean, I do a lot of field research, which I call field research. So I go out to South America. <laughs> and um, I've engaged in various kind of uh, indigenous and uh, kind of religious cult use of, of, of psychedelics in Brazil and Ecuador and Mexico. And I've also been, as you probably saw, a participant. The good thing about being a researcher in this field is you, when people are looking for volunteers, you, it's usually your mates who are doing the research, you get to kind of volunteer first. So, yeah, I've been injected with DMT, psilocybin, and MDMA, and, and put in brain, brain aging. Huh? Not all the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I leave that for the weekend. <laughs> I have a question from near the back. Yes. And then you, sorry. So what about natural induced psychedelic trips? I know it's an entire new topic, but is it, if for example, you're asleep and, and you're releasing loxoracin and you, you get to have a, an actual trip, is it more common to have to experience that if you've taken psychedelics before? Or can it happen to someone who's never, ever had any psychedelics. That's an interesting question. I mean, I, d- I don't know if there's any research on that. I think it's a really interesting question because people have mystical experiences in dreams, right? Uh, you kind of have to pay attention to your dreams, first of all. Some people have them spontaneously even if they don't pay attention to their dreams. But if you want to have a mystical experience in a dream, you're better off studying them, writing them down every day, remembering them, and sure enough, your subconscious will go, oh, hey, you're awake. And we'll kind of bamboozle you in, in an equally bamboozling manner as a, as a psychedelic trip. I know because I've, I've tried it. Um, whether or not that's enhanced by having taken psychedelics, I'm not entirely sure. I don't think there's much research being done on it, but I mean, one of the theories is that you know people may have spontaneous mystical experiences may be due to endogenous psychedelic substances. Okay, so we have psychedelic agents in our body, things like DNT, 5-MeO-DNT, um, and so on. Uh, and that it could be that these build up in the body and maybe kind of are released at kind of times of high stress or whatever, near death experience. And you could have a spontaneous, psychedelically induced mystical experience. Um, we don't know. I mean, for sure, any kind of mystical experience is going to involve some kind of brain chemistry. Uh, all mental activity is going to involve some kind of brain chemistry, whatever you believe even if it's just mediating the experience. Uh, so there probably is some link, I would say, uh, but I haven't got any evidence to back that up. I have to be next one. Yes, you do. You go well done. So I kept pointing at you, man. So <laughs> go for it. You can be next. Um, well, I, I've got the uh, answer to this question. I wanted to ask you, have you ever done research into dreams and mystical experiences? Uh, because throughout all of my life, since I was little, I have everything. And I never take, took any psychedelic drugs because I'm scared of bad trips. So well, I mean, are you being the same camp as, as Young then, really? Because he was the same. I mean, he believed that. He said, you know, what did he say? I think the vision was on trust or something. Uh, because he figured there was enough psychological material from his unconscious in his dreams to keep him going for at least one lifetime. And so he never, he never took psychedelics, even though he was invited to. Um, and so, yeah, dreams are extraordinary. I have actually done research on dreams, um, and I've mostly looked at precognitive dreaming. Uh, so, dreams that foretell the future. And so, I've done experimental work on this, yeah. I, I have lots of uh, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I had a dream about that. So, <laughs> sorry, it's back out. No, this, so these are kind of, for anybody who pays attention to their dreams, these are a relatively frequent occurrence. Um, now, one of the arguments is, well, you only remember the dreams which had some relationship to the future. Well, you never remember all the times you dreamt something and it didn't happen a few days later. So, you know, it's just coincidence and, it, and it's kind of like confirmation bias. You know, we're, we're looking backwards, just remembering those incidences which confirm our underlying belief in dreaming the future. And so, you, you, to understand that, we have to conduct experimental studies under control conditions, which I've done. I've actually conducted the two biggest dream ESP studies ever, uh, which were both positive. One very, very slightly, and one 
quite quite significantly in that uh, something like 600 trials, uh, 60 different people, and they were, whether or not they could dream events that would then, under very controlled conditions, uh, correlate to future events. I won't go into the details of that, but so it's a common occurrence. If you, if you record your dreams every day, and there's various diary studies that have tested to that, the, the typical figure seems to be about 10% of dreams have some relationship to future events. So it's a common experience if you study your dreams. Uh, as for mystical dreams, yeah, Jung and talks about these. Uh, many indigenous traditions which, which uh, enjoy <coughs> altered states talk about these kind of level of dreams. That's the thing about our culture. Um, there's a, an anthropologist called Charles Loughlin, who's kind of a proponent of this field of neurophenomenology, it's not neuroscience and phenomenological experience. And he, he said that our culture is a monophasic culture. We only really value the everyday waking state, you know, culturally as being valuable for you know, decision making, work, production, all this kind of stuff. We don't really value other altered states. We don't value dreams. You're allowed to get drunk, that's pretty much it, but that's kind of as, as a means of relaxation. We wouldn't trust you at work if you were drunk, you know. Uh, so we don't have this kind of engagement with other altered states. And he says that other cultures, lots of indigenous cultures, are polyphasic. You know, they, 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 they value dreams, they value psychedelic states, they value meditative states, and so on. And they base their reality on information coming from those states of consciousness as much as the waking state of consciousness, sometimes more. So it's something to do with our cultural heritage. Uh, yes, question over here. Uh, that's a very good question. So, what people, what personality characteristics predict mystical experiences? I'm not sure if I can remember what they did. The John Hopkins research is the most kind of prevalent on this uh, front, and I'm not sure they had any particular personality dimensions which predicted mystical experience. Um, I mean, one thing is all the people who took part were, were high on openness to experience already. And then those who had mystical experiences came out even higher on openness to experience. They were also relatively low on neuroticism as well. So they were just the people who self-selected to take part. So we can't really extrapolate from that. What we do know is that neuroticism seems to be related to the incidence of negative ex psychological experiences. So those people scoring higher in neuroticism are, are more likely to have challenging psychological experiences, as you might expect. But in terms of mystical experience, I don't think we know what the, what the predictor, predictors are. I don't, anyway. Somebody might. But there's this theory that, like, that people are differently sen sensitive, and there's, there's around one fifth of the population that's like, quite highly sensitive. And that's also slightly neuro related to neuroticism. So I wonder if there might be an interest. Yeah, I think if you took a measure of something like transliminality, or uh, which is a, I mean, you get the, the tendency for your consciousness to kind of go across thresholds and boundaries, or something like uh, uh, boundary thinness, which is a very similar concept, or um, uh, maybe even absorption states, things like that. So those people who, that's kind of like a measure of, of those kind of indices of, you know, sensitivity to anomalous experiences or mystical experiences. Um, people maybe with temporal lobe symptoms as well might be more prone to have these experiences. People who score high on schizotypy, particularly positive schizotypy, which is a high incidence of unusual experiences, these are the kind of people I would expect probably more likely to have mystical experiences. So I can't be certain. Yeah, go on, we can sneak in another one. Yeah, go on. It's a good question. About addiction, um, like there's the, a theory that isolation is a big factor in causing addiction. Um, and yeah, do you have like do you think that psychedelics affect like the subjective isolation or like actual isolation? Isolation. I don't know what you mean by isolation in, in a kind of like a socio-psychological sense that people feel isolated. Yeah, I think that's yeah. I mean, one of the things. Okay, I mean, one of the kind of catch-all things we're seeing now is that psychedelics increase connectedness, whatever it be, whether it's kind of 
intracerebral connectedness, you know, between different brain regions, connectedness with nature, increased connectedness and empathy with other people, they increase connectedness on, you know, the neurological to the sociological level. So that might well have something to do with their ability to kind of help treat addictions, yeah. Go on, the person behind you. Yeah, um, uh, after, after seeing this, uh, after listening to your speech, which was awesome, by the way, um, uh, it seemed to me like everybody should be taking psychedelics. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, um, you know, for ecological purposes, it seemed, and also people just become better, like the Good Friday Experience showed as well. And uh, um, so, what are the dosages that we should be taking? <laughs> So the first question is, um, you know, first of all, just put a caveat, I wouldn't uh, advise or encourage anybody to do anything illegal, <laughs> first of all. Uh, people do, however, you know, and people have continued to do it despite the laws, and uh, there's a community of people out there who do that, and they're the ones who know about the kind of best practice often, and uh, in some respects, in terms of like dosage and all those kind of things. That information is all out there. Failing them can read my book, no, that's not true. Um, but I mean, the, there is a lot of information out there, particularly there's websites, user websites like erowid.org, which is, has thousands and thousands of pages about all different substances. And it's, it's been kind of collated and collected by users uh, who are the ones who have the most experience with these substances. Uh, if people are going to, people are going to do what they're going to do anyway, right, regardless of the law. But, if people do do that, it's, it's probably advisable that they do it with homework. You know, they do some homework on it. They consider set and setting uh, and the context and, and all of these kind of things. Uh, so don't, you know, I wouldn't certainly would advise anyone to do it or encourage them. But if they did, they should certainly do it with the best information. The second question is, you know, people are taking DMT, even psychiatrists and all kinds of people typically report have experiencing another world, which is actually the title of my book, and it talks about DMT in there a lot, uh, and whether or not these uh, experiences people have of other worlds are real. So I've tried to explore this experimentally, uh, or at least existentially, and, and from a research perspective. It's very difficult to answer that question. But one of the underlying features of people having DMT experiences is they say it's more real than real. You know, I went to this crazy other world, I met all these beings, and it's more real than this real. You know, the people come back changed from those experiences. Uh, a lot of people, even atheists, will come back having some kind of spiritual beliefs following those experiences. Is it actually real or not? Well, we can't actually say with any certainty. Um, doesn't mean we can't try and, try and get at it scientifically, which is what I'm trying to do. But you'll have to read my book to find out more about it. <laughs> what a tease, eh? Fantastic. Pressing here. Good to see too. Uh, so there was a session at BC that I didn't actually make it to, um, I didn't get to see it, but it was on um, the Czech, the, the, the Czech Soviet Republic or whatever, um, before the Soviet Union broke up, it was actually supporting a lot of research on psychedelics when the West was not having any whatsoever. Um, and I found that odd. I had. I was talking to somebody, of, I can't remember the name of the guy, but it was a Hungarian guy who I think was largely responsible for popularizing uh, tantric theory in the West. And as a result of his explorations into that, um, he was put in a mental hospital in the 60s or whatever in, by Hungary, um, basically for his explorations in tantra. And so it was counterintuitive for me when I read the little description of the session at BC on like apparently they were quite sympathetic to it in, I don't know, the, the Soviet, Czechoslovakia, whatever it was. Um, and I was wondering if you have any other, I mean, obviously it's the profit motive that is 
you know, uh, th th that's how the system runs is on profit, and so there's no there's no profit in psychedelics for the pharmaceutical companies, and they're the ones holding all the money, and so they're not funding it or supporting it at all, and so there's no support. And so, I, would, I mean, in a socialist system, uh, you don't have the profit motive, and then apparently, I don't know, I didn't see the session, unfortunately, I was sad to miss it, but. Thank you, so talking about a, a, a talk, it was a break from promoting our brilliant conference, so just pointing out I've got a few books from that conference here as well, if anyone's interested. Uh, love a plug. Uh, that he didn't go to because there were so many lectures on. I, don't, I didn't see 90% of them. Online, you can watch them all free online. Yeah, you can yeah. watch it on free online. Yeah. We've put them all up there. But it was about the, the history of psychedelic use in Czech Republic, I Czech, Czechoslovakia, as it was. Uh, and yet yeah, they were very big on psychedelic research. Then they are, again, now, there was a kind of, again, like everywhere else, there was a long hiatus in the middle from the 70s onwards uh, but they were one of the few places um, outside of Switzerland uh, and before the CIA started making their own LSD because actually most people who took LSD in the 60s was because of the CIA because they made kilos of the stuff and were kind of giving it away really nearly. Um, it was the Czech Republic was the biggest producer of it at the time and so you know give rise to Psychedelic psychotherapy with the standard Roth started there, and also a lot of other research. So there was a lot of kind of pioneering work done in the Czech Republic, which we, we probably don't know much about because it was behind the Iron Curtain. They are now as well kind of s somewhat pioneering that research again. They're one of the few places in the world which have governmental funding currently to do psilocybin uh, depression research. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know why they did, they, they, like everywhere else, there was a hiatus. It's not like the Soviet Union picked up on this and, and thought for the greater good we'll develop this and you know, screw the Americans. They kind of followed suit with the rest of the world, it seems, and, and squashed um, the use of psychedelics, probably because, you know, they, they do tend to make people ask questions and think for themselves and all those kind of things, which you probably don't need in a totalitarian regime, right? So that becomes problematic to governments, usually. Um, aside from the potential uses on a med medical level, <coughs> so then you can't really, you, you can't really have kind of medical pharmaceutical development of psychedelics without running the risk of, of having loads of hippies uh, starting a counterculture and telling everyone the government's bad, right? So that's probably why it didn't get developed in, in the Soviet Union. But the Stasi's just come for me now. Sorry, yeah. it's time to finish. Okay, well thank you very much everybody, I'll start the question.